So the friends passed off the scene because Job said to them, well, very often the wicked don't suffer. And they had no answer to that. And finally, Job was left with two monologues of his own. And he was forced into a position where because they kept telling him he was so unrighteous, he had to propose that his own righteousness was intact. And he overstated that point. Not only did he say that, but because they kept saying, God is punishing you because of wickedness, God, Job said, I haven't done this wickedness. And therefore, God in some way seems to be making a mistake. Or at least God doesn't seem to be part of what's going on. And God doesn't seem to be part of what's going on in the world because we see the wicked prosper. And remember, one of the great themes of Job is the problem of evil in relation to the righteousness of God. And Job saw that as a problem. Why do good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people? It's a very difficult thing for all of us to think about sometimes, particularly if we're suffering for no apparent reason. So in the end, the friends had nothing more to say and Job had nothing more to say. He presented his case and waited for an answer. One of the things that he pleaded for, of course, was a go-between, someone to represent him to God. And Elihu, a young man, stood up bursting with energy and ideas. And he said, I'll be your go-between. And he started out by saying that God is not silent, Job. God speaks to us in many different ways, including by suffering. And in discussing that first point, he arrived at a great truth. He said that sometimes, and in Job's case in particular, he was alluding to, sometimes great suffering is required to deliver us from death, to provide, as he calls it, a ransom, an atonement, so that God is able to attribute to us his righteousness and thereby we are delivered from the pit. Now, how much of the depth of that Elihu understood, we don't know, but I'm sure he had a great understanding of God. But we have seen the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and we understand exactly what that means, that to deliver the human race from death or to provide the opportunity for deliverance from death, the sacrifice of the Son of God was required and he did nothing wrong. So there was a great truth starting to bubble to the surface in this story of Job. And of course, the other thing that Elihu did was to set before Job the righteousness of God and to say, Job, there is no point in trying to deal with this problem. And it's a lesson for us too, as we've talked about. There's no point saying, well, God must have made a mistake. God is acting unrighteously. God is treating me wrongly. He doesn't really understand the situation. And Elihu says that is just impossible. God is righteous in everything that he does and he presents the righteousness of God to Job and he says to Job, God cares for everyone's life. God is deeply involved in the lives of all of us. His purpose is to deliver us from death if that is possible and he warns Job gently because he loves Job but he said, Job, don't go down this path of questioning God and his righteousness, because that may ultimately lead you away from God. God is righteous. We can trust in that fact. And Job did trust in that fact, because as we saw, he knew that God was righteous, but he couldn't understand this other God that seemed to be treating him unrighteously. So at one point he even said, I, I wish the God that I know is righteous could speak to the other God that seems to be tr treating me harshly and sort it out. And at the end of that discussion, he said, one thing's for sure, I know that my Redeemer liveth and this will turn out all right. Well, Elihu ended up by looking around and there was a great storm approaching and he said, you know, the way that God treats the earth, Job, is the way that he treats us. He shapes the earth by storms and violence sometimes, and then sends gentle rain so that we can eat and live and crops are produced. Stand still, Job, and consider the things that are going on around us. And at that point, in the midst of this great growing storm with lightning flashing amongst the clouds, the voice of God enters into the equation. And the answer is completely different to what 
any of us would have thought and certainly anything that we would have come up with on our own. The answer wasn't words of soft consolation, not that they are not valuable and necessary at times, of course they are. But God speaks to Job in a different way. He points out to Job, first of all, that the words that he is speaking, that he has been speaking, are not wise. Who is this that darkeneth counsel without knowledge? Job had spoken things that were unwise and quite wrong. But God didn't condemn him for that, as we, as we know. And then God presented creation in all of its glory. And challenged Job as he challenges all of us. Were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? Of course not. And here's Job sitting in the ashes thinking about these things. Were you there when I set the bounds of the sea? No. Do you, know, do you really know about the cycle of light and darkness and lots of other things God presented about the wonder of creation, concluding in the universe itself and whilst Mankind may have learned a lot of things about the cycles of weather and light and darkness and all of those sorts of things. We haven't scratched the surface as far as the universe is concerned. It's beyond our imagination and it was beyond Job's imagination and, Job, and God wanted Job to understand that. The universal power of God, but to understand particularly that Job, everything is under control. If I can manage the path of these massive stars through the universe, as I do, then I can manage your life as well. But in the process of presenting his great power, which was, would, of course, have been extremely impressive to Job, as it is to all of us, he also introduces the great power of his morality. And he said, for example, when he was talking about the sea, he likened the sea to pride. How so? Well, he said, what I've done with the sea, this massive body of water that we couldn't control, I have set bounds for it. It comes up to the edge of Lake Macquarie, but it doesn't come any further, although probably in the last month it might have come a little bit further. But generally the bounds of the sea are set. And he said, that's what I've done to the proud waves of the sea. And when it comes to the light, the, the sun comes up each morning as we express it and gradually the darkness disappears from all the nooks and crannies in the earth. And he said that's the way that the, as, as light gets rid of darkness, so my light will get rid of wickedness. So he starts to hint at the greater purpose that these things are pointing to. And then he came to the animal creation. Having shown God's great power, now he wanted to show Job God's great care. And he also wanted Job to begin to understand what could be the reason or the purpose for his particular suffering. And he started off with that picture of the lion that kills the innocent lamb or fawn or gazelle so that it can feed its young. And afterwards, the Filthy raven comes along and pecks the carcass clean. And finally, of course, it doesn't say this, but finally the worms come along and they finish the job. And so God begins to show Job the extent of his universal care. And it's absolutely amazing to Job and to all of us when we start to think about that, to think about the interconnected nature of the world around us and then to start to think about the providence of God. So he presented all of these different animals because what God wanted to show was the initial reaction of the lion and the lamb could be, well, the lion's violent and the lamb's innocent, so the lion's wrong. But that would be true if God only loved the lamb. But God loves the lion as well, as he loves all of his creation and as he loves all of us. So then... God shows to Job the way that he cares for all different animals who survive in all different ways. And here they are, the mountain goat, the ass, the ox, the ostrich, the wild, uh, the war horse, and the hawk and the eagle. Now, what was the deeper meaning 
in this. If in creation in the inanimate world we could start to see the hand of God as it works with the human race, limiting human pride, exposing human wickedness by his light, what do we see here? Well, since, crea since the flood, before the flood, animals were divided into clean and unclean. And the lesson that came out of that ultimately was that the human race is the same. There are those who, in the eyes of God, have been cleansed by the blood of Christ and those who have not been cleansed. There are clean and unclean. And what was paraded before Job was a huge variety of animals which in some way represented the huge variety of human life that there is in the world. So that Job would start to understand the way that providence works and had worked in his life. So there are all different sorts of people. There are very independent people like the mountain goat that's up at the top of the mountains that no one ever sees. There is the domestic ass and the wild ass. And as we look around the hall and as we look around our Bible school, we see that there are lots of different people. We are all very different. We sit in our room up there in uh, our beautiful room up there in Elpis Israel House, which is just above the lawn area outside the cafe, and we see and hear them. The other day we heard a group of beautiful <laughs> wild animals that laughed so loud you couldn't hear yourself think, and they did that for hours. That's one <laughs> particular type of uh, human being that God's created. If you look further afield, though, you will see down by the lake someone on their own, just walking along happy with their own company. We are all different sorts of people, aren't we? Some people are proud type of people. Some are gentle, audacious people, timid people who never say a word, cruel people, kind people, hunters and victims. All of those are part of the human race and God cares for all of us. Now, I'm not trying to pigeonhole anyone into any of those categories. But we are all different, aren't we? Some people are happy to be up in the crags of the rocks on their own, like the mountain goat. But God has provided for the mountain goat and God provides for those of us who are like that. Other people always need to be the centre of attention. They need other people around them, aff affirming that they're funny or that they're interesting to listen to or whatever it is. And God has provided for those people too. There are strong people. There are people that are hard to tame in ecclesial life. But God loves them and is providing for them as well. So we need to think about what Job saw in the context of our lives. As a community, we are all different and God loves all of us. And he is working with all of us and we are an interrelated community so that we can all benefit from our strengths and weaknesses and different characteristics. Just like the creation of God is so interconnected and God, uh, Job, as he was paraded through all of these, began to understand how careful God is. Not only is he awesomely powerful, but he is very careful about intricate details, about that little flower out in the wilderness where no one ever goes. God makes sure that now and then there is enough rain so that the seed springs forth to life again in this beautiful flower form and nobody ever sees it. But God cares very much about that. And God cares very much about each and every one of us. And God cared very much about Job. And Job in the first and last animals, began to understand perhaps something of his own situation, to see that sometimes the innocent suffer for the guilty and that this, or the, the I suppose a lion's not guilty, for the violent. In human terms, of course, it can be the guilty. It is a basic principle of nature. It would be wrong except that God loves all of them. It would be wrong for the violent lion to kill the poor little fawn. But God loves both animals and has provided for both animals. God's love is over all of his creation. And Job now can start to see that his suffering may be for the benefit of somebody else. Now, of course, 
None of them know the backstory at this stage. We don't know whether they ever found out or not, but we do and we have since the start. And we know that's exactly a picture of what had happened. This violent enemy, violent because the things that he requested for Job were of a violent nature. He benefited from the suffering of Job. The suffering of Job was to teach another lesson. But of course, it's much more intricate than that because not only the lion gets to feed his young, but the raven also comes along later and feeds from the carcass. And then, of course, right down to the womb. All survive from that carcass. We come round here this week in 2024 and we benefit from the suffering of Job 4,000 years later. Isn't that amazing? Won't he be amazed when he finds that out? And that's just one example. And, of course, we need to think about that in our own lives as all of us suffer to see what the greater purpose of God is in that suffering, whatever the reason it occurred. It may be for us. It may have been something that God has brought into our lives or it may not have been something that God brought into our lives that has just happened. But it will all have a purpose, and that purpose can be positive if we allow God to work in our lives. We can trust in God because that massive star out in the universe that's flying through space, God's got that in the palm of his hands. He controls all of that, and he can control our lives very well if we allow him to. So at the end of all of that, Job had nothing to say at the start of chapter 40. He had requested this face-to-face -face meeting with God, but all he could say in verse 4 of chapter 40 was, I am vile or I am of small account. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand over my mouth. He had nothing to say. But Yahweh wasn't finished. He wanted to demonstrate an even um, more important truth to Job. So in verse 8, he said, Wilt thou disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? So we've got to finally settle this matter of the righteousness of God versus the righteousness of Job or the righteousness of man. And he said in verse 10, Deck thyself now with majesty and excellence and array thyself with glory and beauty. Right, you are in the position of God, Job. Can you solve this problem? And the problem is stated quite simply in verse 12. Look on everyone that is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked in their place. Can you control human nature, Job? Can you control pride when it's out of control or wickedness when it's out of control, which it very often is, as communities, as nations and as individuals. Can you control these things by your righteousness, Job? Quite a challenge. If you can, he says in verse 14, then I will confess unto thee that thine own right hand can save thee. What God wants to do is to save us, and we cannot save ourselves. And Job is now going to have the final lesson in the importance of the righteousness of God and the righteousness of the rest of us, which is as nothing. And he's going to do it by using two uh, great untamable animals. Now, we could probably have spent the whole week talking about who Behemoth was, and who Leviathan was, and I know that there are different views, but I think the hippopotamus and the crocodile will serve to demonstrate something of what they were like. And I, I tend to think that they probably were that animal. Both are untamable, both are very violent and terrifying animals. Now, the hippopotamus, the behemoth in verse 15, behold now behemoth, which I made with thee. So, again... Job, trust in me. I'm, I made all of these things as we must learn to trust in God. Now consider this great beast, behemoth. Verse 16, 
His strength in his, is in his loins and his force is in the navel of his belly. The hippo is extremely strong, a repulsive-looking animal. If one came at you like that, it would be terrifying. If you were caught in the mouth of a hippopotamus, what a horrible way to die. What an unbelievable way to die. So this is how I'm going to die, in the mouth of a hippo. But these were the animals, and they were both animals in the river of Egypt, not exactly where Job lived, but animals which, which, with which he would have been very familiar. He waves his tail round like a cedar in verse 17. Now, some people say, oh, well, it can't have been the hippo because hippos only have a small tail, whereas the tail of this animal is a cedar. Well, he says he waves it round like a cedar. He doesn't actually say that the tail itself is big like a cedar tree. And perhaps what he means is that human beings tend to do that too. Little things that are really insignificant, they like to wave around as if it was some huge achievement. I've had a hole in one in golf. If ever that happened to me, I would be, I'd spend one session talking about that to you. But really, what does it mean? Nothing at all. So the hippo waves his tail around a lot, but really it's quite insignificant. And perhaps proud human beings or wicked human beings are a bit like that. Verse 18, his bones are as strong uh, pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. It's very hard to penetrate brass and iron to get to the heart of a wicked or a proud person. And remember, we are taming pride and wickedness now. He is a very violent animal. Verse 19 in the revised version, the second half of it says, um, he, he that made him hath furnished him with his sword. I think in reference to the teeth of the hippo. And this is what makes the hippopotamus such a dangerous animal. Its teeth apparently are razor sharp and they keep sharpening themselves every time it closes its mouth so that the hippopotamus kills more people per year than any other of the large African animals. It is a very dangerous animal. It's an untamable, extremely territorial animal and if you venture into its world, it'll kill you very quickly. It moves fast. So it might look cute and there's some lovely little cuddly hippo toys but they are a very dangerous animal and they are untamable. He says down in verse um, 24, reading from the RSV, can one take him with hooks or pierce his nose with a snare? No, you can't. You can't control human wickedness and pride, Job. You can't. You can't go down to the shore of the Nile River with a fishing rod and cast it out and think, I'm going to catch a hippo today. He'll kill you very quickly if you get in his way. So that was animal number one. Animal number two is Leviathan. I think Leviathan is the crocodile. Verse 1 of chapter 41, canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? Can you go fishing for a crocodile down by the edge of the river? Of course you can't. Of course you can't. It's a terrible-looking animal. It's part of the group of animals that have represented um, wickedness and pride ever since the Garden of Eden, the seed of the serpent, which goes right through the scripture. It stops off here in Job chapter 41 and it continues through the prophets, through Daniel chapter 7, right into Revelation when the fight is a beast versus a lamb. Well, here it is for Job. Can you tame a crocodile? Would you ever dare try to tame a crocodile? Of course we wouldn't. Verse 4, what can we do with a crocodile? Would you try and make an agreement with it? If you were swimming in the water and it came up to you with its mouth open, you say, hey, hang on a second. Let's talk this through. <laughs> By the time you've done that, of course, I forget how much the downward pressure of a crocodile is, but it's enormous. If he does that and misses you, it's only about seven pound opening. So just calmly grab him round the mouth and hold it shut. You'll be able to do that. <laughs> so I believe. But you, you, can't, you can't make an agreement with a crocodile. You, you, in verse 4, he can't be your servant. Sin can't be our servant. We can't enter into an agreement with him and say, well, I'll allow a little bit of sin into my life, but no more. As Brother Steve pointed out this morning, the more he comes in, the more he wants. 
So you don't enter in agreement with a crocodile. You don't play with him like a pet in verse 5. Come on, crocodile, sit on my finger like a little bird. You don't bind him so that your little girls in your family, I've got something for your kids, I've got this crocodile for you to play with. Have fun. You can't do that. You can't take him in verse 6 to a banquet. I've been invited out to dinner and I'll be bringing my crocodile along if that's all right. So it's exaggeration really to show us that none of us has the ability to control wickedness and pride. They're out of control. You can't take him down to the shop and sell him in verse 6 as well. You can't do anything with him except kill him. And we don't have the ability to kill him, but God does. Ultimately, God can do that for us. And so he trots that out, animal out as well. And he concludes in verse 34 of chapter 41 by saying, he, he beholdeth all high things. He is king over all the children of pride. So he picks out two creatures that are untamable and deadly and says to Job, that's human pride and wickedness. You're God. You wanted to be God. Your righteousness, can you control those things? And, of course, none of us can control that things. And we understand the power of that metaphor that God is using there in teaching Job. The only thing, ultimately, that could beat that was that. And isn't that a beautiful principle of the truth? And when you come to Revelation, of course, it's a battle between a beast and a lamb. And the lamb won the battle. That's the amazing thing. What a beautiful story the truth is. But only God could do that. We can't do it. And so the storm passes. Perhaps the sun comes out and it's time for the final conversation in chapter 42. Job answers God. He's now going to have a say. And in verse 2 he says, I know now that you can do everything that no thought can be withholden from thee. No plan of yours can be thwarted, Job says. And that's what we need to know as well, isn't it, brethren and sisters and young people, that God can do everything. He can do everything for us. He will do everything for this world and establish his kingdom. And that was different to the, the things that Job said before. He thought that, Job, that God had made a mistake. He no longer thought that. Verse 3, the words that God had said at the start of his speech, Job ascribes to himself. Some people say, oh, was he talking to Elihu or was he talking to the friends? No, he was talking to Job and Job realises that. He quotes what God had said. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? It's me. Therefore I have uttered things I understood not, things too wonderful for me which I knew not. And we can venture into that area, can't we, brethren and sisters, sometimes of getting a bit above our station and thinking that we can speak on behalf of God or we know this or we know that when we don't really. We know the truth. We've been blessed with that. But we ought not to think that we know too much. And Job now understood that he, he'd gotten above his station in challenging God in the way that he did. Verse 4, again quoting the words of God, Here I beseech thee, and I will speak, and I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. That's what Job had asked for, and God said, I'm going to give it to you. Here's your opportunity. Here's your opportunity to have your say. Well, he said, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. I really didn't know what I was talking about. And he says in verse 6, Wherefore I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. He used this word abhor a few times. He abhorred his life. There were children that abhorred him because of the terrible circumstances that he was in. There were other people that he had abhorred, people that dwelled out in the wilderness, he said whose children I wouldn't have deigned to put to look after my flocks. Wasn't that interesting that God said to him, there are plants out right out in the wilderness that I care about. Perhaps Job thought, yeah, 
I should care about those people because God loves them as well. But Job abhorred himself. It doesn't mean that we have to walk around being depressed and hating ourselves. But what it means is we need to understand what our righteousness is. The NEB translates that to melt away. Job's righteousness melted away. And he said, I repent in dust and ashes. And when I think about that, I think that probably there was a sigh of relief for Job. It's got nothing to do with my righteousness. What a relief. I can't do anything, but I can depend on God. And that's a great relief for all of us. When it says in Galatians that Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law or from the curse of law, I think that's part of how Job felt then. He was redeemed from the curse of law. The curse of thinking that I've got to save myself, that my righteousness has to stack up to whatever anyone else can throw at it. It can't. I can't control, I can't tame the hippo and I can't tame the crocodile. And in the end, it doesn't mean we give in to sin, we don't don't bargain with the crocodile, but we do say, I don't have to depend on myself. My righteousness is nothing. I can depend on God. And I think that in that repentance of Job in dust and ashes was probably a, a great release for him from the pressure that he'd been feeling. He had finally learned that he could trust in God and not only that, that suffering, even his suffering, had a much higher purpose than what he realised and that perhaps there were wider ramifications of his suffering. And he's about to find out that that's exactly true because God's attention now is turned on the friends. Now, the poem finishes at the end of verse 6, and now we return to the, to the narrative. As I said before, you can really read Job 1 and 2 and Job 42 verse 7 onwards as a self-contained story of salvation. So now God turns to the friends. And I imagine as, as the voice of God is going through all these things, perhaps they're starting to feel a little bit nervous about how they're going to come out in all of this. Well... So they should have been. As we said, they were good friends, but they behaved very badly and they should have done better. So now Yahweh turns to the friends in verse 7 and said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against thee and against thy friends, for you have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job hath. Now, Job hadn't always spoken what was right, but finally he had spoken what was right. And much of what he said during his discussions was right also. And much of what the friend said was wrong. And being right and wrong, truth and error is important. And they had been in error. And God wanted them to know that he was very angry because of their error. His wrath was kindled at the way they had treated Job and at the wrong things that they had said. And Job now was saying what was right. And he was going to become, in type, their saviour. What a turnaround. Verse 8, Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly. In other words, if you want me to deal with you according to your false belief in exact retribution, then it won't turn out well. So you go and make an offering, I'll accept it through Job, and then I won't deal with you in the way that you felt that I was dealing with him. Boy, what words to hear for those three. But there's no hint that Job sat there saying, I told you so, I told you so. He wasn't. He was a different man now. Once he probably would have said that. He would have loved these words from God, but not now because he's been educated as to what he is and to what the problem 
of human nature is. To their credit, to their credit, there's not a hint of objection from them. Straight away in verse 9, life as the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, Zophar the Naamathite went and did according as Yahweh commanded them. Yahweh also accepted Job. There's an example in there, isn't there, too? If we have made a mistake, if we have treated people badly, and it becomes obvious that we have, don't try and order it down. Don't try and argue a position or debate the whole thing. Just accept it. Take your lumps and do what God says. And I believe that they did that because I believe at heart they were faithful men also. So they went to Job uh, according as Yahweh had said and in verse 10, now Job is still sitting down covered in boils, stinking, foul, steps away from death. Nothing's changed there but they've been told, I want you to go to that man and there will be salvation. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? Because we think of our Lord on the cross, the terrible condition that he would have been in, and that was the means of salvation, amazingly. And Job here is a type of our Lord. And his actions, of course, are wonderful as well because it says in verse 10 that Yahweh turned the, the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends and not until he had prayed for his friends. So Job prayed to God on behalf of his friends when he was still sitting there in uh, repenting in dust and ashes and in terrible physical condition. He prayed on behalf of his friends. There was no vindictiveness in Job now. He truly was a type of our Lord. And when that happened... Then God showed all of us a little glimpse into the future because Job then was healed and God gave to him twice as much as what he would had before. So in Job chapter 1, he'd had seven sons and three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 she asses. And it says in chapter 42, down in verse 12, that he got twice as much as that in sheep, camels, oxen, and she asses. And I think there we have a real indication, a real indication that Job's children were faithful in chapter 1. They weren't partying drunkards. They were faithful young people who were trying to grow up and follow the example of their faithful father. And they were involved in the sacrifices that he was making. They understood that cursing God secretly in their hearts was no good, that God requires our hearts and minds, not just our externals. They knew what true religion was because he only got seven sons and three daughters back. He didn't get twice as many sons and daughters. Why? Well, clearly he's getting the blessing of the firstborn here, a double portion in the kingdom. I believe he will have 14 sons and six daughters, and he will realise the blessing of the firstborn that God begins to show to him here. So I think that's a lovely little point that comes out in this last chapter, and I suspect that Job would have understood that. He was a very faithful and discerning man. Verse 11 talks about the situation afterwards. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been his acquaintances before, and they'd eat bread with him in his house. These were all of the people that had mocked him and laughed at him and walked past him and derided him because of what had happened to him. He talked about them earlier on in the book of Job. But there was no vindictiveness in Job, uh, and he rejoiced at the way that God had uh, healed him, at the things that God had showed him, and they each brought to him a piece of money every one an earring of gold. So the price of redemption is contained in this beautiful picture of really the kingdom of God, of salvation through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, where was the adversary in all of this? I don't know. I wish I could give you a definitive answer. I think there's two answers. One is that after the events of chapter 1, 
if the adversary was a, a just a person who was a member of the ecclesia, which I believe he was, because of the terrible things that happened to Job and his feeling of being responsible, perhaps he just walked away. A bit like Judas Iscariot walked away. His conscience troubled him afterwards, but he never tried to come back to the Lord Jesus Christ. And perhaps the adversary never tried to enter into the fold of Job's friends again. That's one option. Or perhaps he was part of the all that is in verse 11. Perhaps he himself sat around and listened and finally thought, oh, no, what have I done? And it would be lovely to think that the terrible things that Job went through actually resulted in the salvation of the person who put him through them or caused him to be put through them. And that may explain why at no point during the discussion did God intervene and say, look, this is actually why this is happening. Because if he'd done that, then the adversary would have been put in a terrible situation. I don't know. There's two alternatives. Um, and I don't even know which one I'm swinging towards. I tend to think that perhaps he was uh, saved as a result of, Job went, of what Job went through. But I also realise, as you do, that not everyone is saved. Judas Iscariot wasn't saved even though our Lord died for him also. So you can have a think about that and discuss that. And finally, in verse 16, it says that Job lived 140 years, saw his sons and his sons' sons even for generations. That was after the, um, the trial. So I think that Job may have lived for 210 years. He might have been 70 years old when this happens. And afterwards, he lived 140 years. So he got a double blessing of life also. I think that's probably the likely um, uh, explanation of that, but you can talk about that as well. Now, let's go over to James very quickly as we bring our thoughts to a close. We've been in James before. Just come to James chapter 1, please. James uses the word endurance. Carefully, it's translated patience, but really the word is endurance. I don't know that Job was a particularly patient man. Sometimes we say that the patience of Job, because it says that in, in um, James, but really it's the endurance of Job. He became quite impatient for time, but his endurance never left him. And at the start of his epistle, James said in verse 3 of chapter 1, Know this, that the trying of your faith worketh endurance but let endurance have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing that was job wasn't it verse 12 of chapter 1 blessed is the man that endureth temptation same word for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life which the lord hath promised to them that love him and in the midst of his endurance job said i can't find god at the moment but i know he's there and I believe that ultimately I will come forth as gold once, he, once the trials are finished. So Job's endurance produced a crown of gold. And over in chapter 5, the word endurance returns. It's not the word patient that's, translate, that's used in verse 7 to 10. That's a different word. It returns in verse 11. We count them happy which endure. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the end. We've all seen that together this week. And I believe that he goes on to allude to some of the events of what happened in Job's life. Look at verse 12. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. That was what Elihu had talked about when he talked about prayer. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the ecclesia and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The friends didn't do that. They didn't pray for him. And they didn't use the word of God to calm, to soothe his sore body. Rather, they, they, they kept adding to his affliction. Because the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. Verse 16, confess your faults one to another. Let's understand that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the position we start from when dealing with a problem in the ecclesia related to sin and human nature. We are all in the same boat. And that certainly wasn't 
the thing that was done for Job. But finally, and I believe at the, the second half of verse 16, tells us the sort of prayer that Job offered on behalf of his friends. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What better summary could be could there be of that prayer that I'm sure that Job offered? One final thing back in Job, and I know we've only got a few minutes to go, but we did start three minutes late, or was it four minutes late? I can't quite remember. Anyway, back in the final chapter of Job, just a lovely little footnote here that we can't miss. In verse 14 of the last chapter, he had seven sons and three daughters. We didn't know the name of any of them at the start, but now we're given the names of the daughters. And we're specifically told that Job called the name of the first Jemima. And Jemima means a dove. A dove. The bird of innocence. And if in the, if in the days of Job, I was to say, imagine if, good name for a game actually, um, <laughs> Imagine if, imagine if the ecclesia was a bird, you would say the dove because that was the bird that returned to Noah. So he called the first of his daughters a dove, unlike the raven that pecked away at the carcass. Just an interesting point on that. I must make this point. The lion was a symbol of Israel right from the beginning, even though it wasn't a clean beast. And the Jews put the Lord Jesus Christ to death and that will ultimately lead to their salvation. The raven was a symbol of the unclean Gentiles like us. And the unclean Gentiles, ever since the Jews put Jesus to death, the unclean Gentiles have been feeding on that carcass, not to, put, not to be too graphic. We do that every Sunday morning so that we can be saved. Be that as it may, Job called his daughter a dove, representing innocence. He called his second daughter Kezia which is a fragrance. It was one of the um, fragrances contained in the Mosaic law, a sweet-smelling savour unto God. And the third one he called Karen Hapak, which means beautiful eyes, beautiful eyes. And, of course, now he saw. And I think in some ways those three daughters are typical of the three phases of the ecclesia. Before the flood, it was a time of innocence represented beautifully by the dove that came back to Noah. After the flood in the days of the law of Moses, well, it was the fragrance of the offerings ascending as a sweet-smelling savour, and part of that was the cassia in the incense that smelt so beautiful. And finally, in the Christian era, well, we have eyes now, beautiful eyes that can see the things that in the Old Testament they could only look forward to in prospect. We know that the Lord Jesus came and lived and died and rose from the dead. So in the names, I think there is a beautiful little message and that the ecclesia itself will receive an inheritance. And it's quite specific in verse 15 that the daughters received an inheritance as well. I see our brother reaching for the bell, but we've got a couple of minutes left. Okay, let's, let's finish then. Sorry, we haven't got a couple of minutes left. We'll leave that. I was going to go through the things that we could do for each other, but what we can all do for ourselves is to trust in God. That's one of the key takeouts from this book. So at the start of the book, Job was a perfect and an upright man who feared God and shunned evil. By the end of the book, he was still the same. The adversary had been wrong, and God had shown that there are those who will dedicate themselves to God's righteousness for the sake of that righteousness alone. And that's why we are Christadelphians. Where once Job had heard, finally he saw. What did he see? He saw a God who is just and righteous and a God of love, a God who will care for all of our needs just as surely as he cares for the awesome universe that he has created. From the hugest star in the heavens to the smallest worm, God cares for everything. He saw a God who speaks in many ways, including through suffering. We can trust that God who controls the paths of the stars in heaven can and does control the path of our life if we let him. Life teaches us that we have no righteousness of our own, but we have learnt to love God's righteousness. We love the truth, and so we should. 
The problem of evil in relation to God's righteousness has been solved. We understand why good things happen to bad people or why bad things happen to good people sometimes. We can see it in the story of Job. Whilst all suffering may not have a reason, it does have a purpose. And though we can't always find that purpose, we can always trust in Yahweh, our loving God. And I know that there are people here who suffer enormously. And we hope that that gives all of us an opportunity as a community to show the love of God to those people and to bear them up as best we can in their time of difficulty. And the greatest example we have, it all points, of course, to our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and what he did to us. So there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And then the experience of that man who lost everything and became a pathetic, disgusting figure of suffering and humiliation, because that's what he was, we have seen something totally surprising, totally divine. We have seen that the Lord that we serve is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Thank you, Brother Jack, for your studies on Job this week. Much appreciation from everyone here. Um, we're going to have a break now for morning tea. It's a 40-minute break, so back here at 11.30 sharp, please, and all be seated and quiet to kick off with Brother Jim's final study. Um, if you all bow your heads, I'll give a prayer for morning tea. Our loving Father in heaven, we humbly bow before you now. We thank you for this day and for this opportunity to be filled with your word, for our consciences to be pricked, our hearts to be filled by the depth of love and care for us in your word. What a blessing this place is where we can, we can gather together in safety and we can learn so much from the studies that have been prepared for us. Father, help us to see each other as made in your image. And as our Lord Jesus encouraged us, help us to go the very go, to help us to go to the very root of sin. And armed with your wisdom to stop sin in its tracks, to control our thinking and to focus our minds on your ways, to focus our minds on your words and on your righteousness. Help us to endure temptation, to trust in you, and to trust that you are right, that you can't lie, and that you will do what you say you will do. Help us to remember that we, we cannot save ourselves. Father, it's only in your son that we have life, and we are so looking forward to the day when the, when the lamb will defeat the beast for good. Please be with us as we have a break now be in our thoughts and our conversations. We are so grateful for the food that we are about to have and we know that we would have nothing without you. We offer this prayer now in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>